Brothers and sisters, please join me in a word of prayer before I begin. Almighty God, we confess that in this space, your presence is with us in your word, in the administration of your sacrament, in the faces of all the saints gathered here today by faith. Father, I pray that you make your presence known to all of those gathered here. Father, impart to us the wisdom of your Holy Spirit. And ultimately, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, I pray that these may be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Those of us who know our New Testaments really well know that each of the four Gospels have different characteristics that make them unique. For example, the Gospel of Matthew is often seen as the Jewish Gospel because it was written to a primarily Jewish audience and uses Jewish themes to teach its message. The Gospel of John, in another example, is seen as the evangelical or missional Gospel because John is very clear that he is writing this Gospel so that others might come to believe in Jesus Christ. And so if we're looking at all these characteristics and we looked at the Gospel of Mark, we can, in one way, call Mark the action gospel. Mark is very much concerned with the actions of Jesus Christ in his miracles, in the way that he exercises demons. And Jesus doesn't talk quite as much as he does uh, in the gospel of Mark in comparison to uh, the other gospels. So with all these facts in mind, it's interesting that Mark would take something of an aside to tell us this very detailed story about the death of John the Baptist. It's interesting because throughout the rest of the story, the focus is Jesus Christ, and yet it's almost like he's taking this break or this excursus away from the ministry of Jesus. So why would he do this? Why would he focus so much time on this figure where he plays a prominent role and Jesus seems to play something of a background character? But I think we would do well to remember when the Gospel of Mark was written and why the Gospel of Mark was written. The Gospel of Mark was written in a time when a lot of Christians were being attacked and persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. And so Mark includes this story in a way to provide encouragement to Christians who are being attacked and persecuted for what they believe, giving them a sense that there have been many great people, many great apostles, many great prophets that have come before them and have suffered the same persecution that they now face in their own context. So with that fact in mind, it's easy for us to understand why Mark would spend so much time in detail on this story. And I think today can also provide us a degree of comfort and encouragement in our day. As the Apostle Paul writes, there are two types of wisdom that we experience today. There is the wisdom of the age, and there's the wisdom of the spirit. The wisdom of the age is the wisdom of our rulers, of the philosophers, of academics, of popular societal opinion. That is the wisdom of the age, according to Paul. But the wisdom of the spirit is something very different. The wisdom of the spirit can only come by faith in Jesus Christ, and it can only be imparted by the Holy Spirit. What's interesting is that Paul writes that these two kinds of wisdom are in conflict with one another. The wisdom of the spirit is seen as foolishness to the wisdom of the age. Yet Paul confesses that it is the wisdom of the spirit that is true. And it is the wisdom of the spirit that we as Christians must cling to. For a long time in the United States... I think it's fair to say that there's been a large degree of overlap between the wisdom of the age and the wisdom of the spirit. In a country where the vast majority of our presidents have identified as Christian, in a time when it's been the popular position to go to church on every Sunday, it's easy for us to see how Christianity, in a way, has been a part of America's wisdom of the age. But as I'm sure many of us can tell throughout generation after generation, these two things have a decreasing overlap. 
and they're becoming more and more separate from one another. Whereas at one time, it was the popular thing to do to go to church every Sunday morning. Now it's seen as the unpopular thing to do in a lot of cases, to go to church on Sunday mornings. So what do we do about this increasing distance between our wisdom of the spirit and the culture's wisdom of the age? Many of you have heard me talk about the early church father, Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr was someone who wrote around the second century and debated a lot of people around him. And it's interesting that Justin Martyr mentions that a lot of pagans in his time in the Roman Empire accused Christians of being atheists. Now, this didn't mean that Christians didn't worship any god whatsoever, but by the label atheist, Romans, pagans, were essentially blaming Christians for having non-belief in the gods of the Roman Empire and disbelief in what Rome called divinely inspired. So church, I think it's of utmost importance and utmost seriousness for us today as we move forward into the future to understand what it truly means to be called atheists once again. Not to say that we don't believe in the one true God fully revealed to us in Jesus Christ, but to be accused of having disbelief in the pantheon of gods that our culture continually preaches to us. Throughout the 90s and the earlier part of the 2000s, I remember it started becoming popular for non-Christians to raise their opposition to evangelical Christianity. Keep your religion to yourself. Don't shove your religion down my throat. And one of my personal favorites is keep your theology off of my biology. Maybe some of you have seen that bumper sticker. But what I find interesting, church, is how over time it seems these two roles have reversed. We just exited what many people are calling Gay Pride Month, and this has obviously increased in popularity over time. Church, there is a deep sense that we have been preached to for the past 30 days during Gay Pride Month. Now, some people might protest that, well, those are two very different things, right? There's nothing religious about Gay Pride Month. Oh, really? There's nothing religious about Gay Pride Month? There's nothing worshipful about a Gay Pride Parade? There's nothing evangelical about putting a drag queen on a children's show like Blue's Clues. There's nothing spiritual about any of this. No spirituality in the idolization of human sexuality. Church, the truth of the matter is that the dogmatic, fundamentalist, evangelical drive of our culture has remained. The only thing that's changed is the religion that it preaches. In this story of Herod and John the Baptist, we see great examples of both a wisdom of the age and a wisdom of the spirit. In Herod's palace, we see a lavish party full of all kinds of wild living, drinking, promiscuity. This is the wisdom of the age that's celebrated then as it is today. And if many of us are being honest, we would say that there is something somewhat tempting about this party of Herod. No rules. Anything goes. We can do and behave however we want to. But then we see where the wisdom of the Spirit resides in the story, and it's in John the Baptist. There seems to be nothing appealing about the wisdom of the Spirit in this light, because John the Baptist is laying alone in a prison cell while everyone else is upstairs having the time of their lives. Anybody reading this story would prefer one over the other. But we see how the party of Herod is full of questions and full of superstition. Herod raises the concern that John the Baptist is raised from the dead. All kinds of beliefs are all over the place in Herod's party. So where is the victory in this story for us as Christians today? 
it seems to be a very tragic end for John the Baptist. And if we're seeing the party of Herod as this wisdom of the age, we would do well, church, to recognize that there is increasing hostility against the wisdom of the Spirit. Does Herodias, the wife of Herod, does she stop at John just being cast out of her presence? Is she satisfied when John is thrown into prison? No. But her hatred is cruel, and it is relentless. And I fear, church, that the wisdom of the age is going to be also very cruel and relentless in the days to come. So again, where is the hope? Where is the victory for us in this story? Our Lord Jesus Christ compels us to take heart and remember that if the world hates us, that we do well to remember that the world hated him first and foremost, and that we are hated not for our own sake alone, but for the sake of Jesus Christ. So the death of John the Baptist is a foreshadowing of the death to come in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. How quick we are to forget that the God we worship could not escape suffering, persecution, and death. So who are we to assume that we would escape anything different? But that is not the end of the story. Because on the third day, our Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead and conquered the grave on our behalf. And this is the faith we cling to in times of difficulty, in times when our culture begins to decreasingly see the value of Christianity. It's interesting that Herod believes that John the Baptist has raised from the dead at the beginning of this story. But little does he know that John the Baptist will raise from the dead. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we confess that John the Baptist lives on in the testimony of Jesus Christ, always pointing us to the gospel as he did in his ministry on earth. So church, let us take heart in the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ suffered also, and that God has chosen to suffer alongside our suffering. Make no mistake, he does not promise worldly prosperity or comfort or wealth or success in this life, and certainly not by the world's standards. But what he does promise us is life eternal with the one who loves us, the one who created us for himself. And through that, we have our hope. So church, may we be strengthened by this faith, and may we have courage in the days ahead to hold fast to our confession and our faith, imparted to us by Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.